Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jim. I want to welcome you to the Great Books course of uh, Ubiquity University and our Wisdom School. Uh, this is the second of two lectures on Viktor Frankl's uh, book, Man's Search for Meaning. <clears throat> I gave my first lecture last month, and we were going to uh, conclude uh, today um, with a overview of his uh, logo therapy. Uh, and uh, I thought I would start uh, with just a, a summary also of his life, uh, just to bring everybody into the present moment. Uh, Viktor Frankl uh, was one of three children. He was born in uh, Vienna, uh, Austria, uh, to uh, moderately well-to-do uh, parents. Uh, he was very precocious. Uh, as a child, uh, and by the time he was 16, had already determined that he wanted to be a uh, psychiatrist. And even as a teenager, uh, he uh, corresponded with Sigmund Freud, who was also in Vienna. Uh, apparently, they never met, but they exchanged correspondence because uh, Frankel wanted to publish one of Freud's uh, papers in a little journal that he uh, was uh, uh, developing as a student. Uh, he went to the uh, University of Vienna and he studied um, uh, psychiatry and neurology. Uh, he developed his theories of uh, uh, logotherapy when he was only 21 years old. He already had kind of staked out what he thought on these great issues, uh, which we'll come to uh, in a moment, uh, but he was stellar uh, at the university. He got uh, a very good uh, job uh, in the psychiatric um, uh, department of a major hospital. Then, of course, uh, the 1930s with the rise of the Nazis, uh, Viktor Frankl was forced to go to another hospital, a Jewish hospital, um, because he wasn't allowed in the major uh, Steinhoff Hospital. And, um, and then uh, he was married in 1941, and his wife became pregnant with their first child. And then uh, he and his wife and his sister and his father uh, were taken off to the camps. During the course of their camp life, his uh, father died, his brother died in Auschwitz, uh, his uh, wife died, um, uh, they had to abort uh, their child, um, his sister managed to escape somehow, uh, and uh, he, over three years, was in four different concentration camps, including Auschwitz, and Bergen-Belsen. Uh, he, uh, in the course of that time, uh, obviously was in very significant duress. And what he learned <clears throat> through what he suffered was the rest of his life. And he was confirmed in his intuitions about logotherapy. Uh, and when he came out, uh, he uh, finished his PhD and the subject was the unconscious God. And it was an exploration of the relationship between psychology and religion. And uh, he uh, wrote, I think altogether some 39 books, but overwhelmingly uh, the best-selling book that he wrote that brought him to universal fame and attention uh, is the book, a very short book, uh, the book that we're considering, Man's Search uh, for Meaning. And uh, so, as you know, who've read the book, uh, the students should be uh, reading all these things. Uh, the book is divided into two parts. 
the first part is his life in the camps. And that's what we dealt with last month. And the second part is a, a summary, a very concise summary of logotherapy. So that's what I'd like to explore today because I, I find logotherapy to be not only fundamentally true, um, not to the exclusion of others, but uh, fundamentally worth our consideration, but particularly worth our consideration in a time of COVID, in a time of war, uh, in a time of climate change, where the external reality is impinging on us so powerfully, we can't turn our gaze. We have to deal with it, just like he did. If you're in Auschwitz, you got to deal with it. If you're in lockdown, you have to deal with it. So uh, his um, therapy, even though it was a childhood intuition, um, was a very uh, important contribution. And in fact, uh, after Freud and Adler, he's considered the third pillar of, uh, of uh, 20th century uh, psychoanalysis. So uh, that's going to be our subject today, everyone. At the beginning of the second part of the book, he tells the story of uh, 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 an American who comes to his office uh, in Vienna and says, so what's the difference between psychoanalysis uh, and logotherapy? And uh, Viktor Frankl says to him, well, what do you think psychoanalysis is? And the man says, well, you lie down on a couch and you talk about things that are difficult for you to talk about, but are important. And Viktor Frankl uh, quipped back, well, in logotherapy, you don't lie down, uh, you sit up. And it's not so much about what you're going to say as what you need to hear. And I think, as he says, that's a very important consideration. Uh, and it strikes to the heart of the distinction uh, that most psychologists, even to the present day, um, Jungian, Freudian, um, uh, humanistic psychology, um, all are preoccupied with is the internal state of the patient. How are you feeling in relationship to your childhood, in relationship to um, the complexes that have risen up within you, you're neurotic in one way or another, or you're psychotic in one way or another. Um, how do you uh, remember what shaped you into the present uh, moment? And for Viktor Frankl, um, that was not the way logotherapy was designed. Because logotherapy is much less retrospective and much less introspective than almost any other uh, psychological school. And that's a, a very important uh, consideration <clears throat> because for Frankel and logotherapy, it is how one interacts with life, COVID, the invasion of Ukraine, climate change, your spouse, your kids, your job, what you're suffering from, that's the key. So it's not kind of the navel gazing of the Freudians. 
where you go back into these childhood traumas, as important as they may seem. It is how you muster the fortitude and the courage and the authenticity to interact with your situation in such a way that you discover meaning. Because for Viktor Frankl, as we'll see, meaning is not some abstraction. What is the meaning of life? The only question is, what is the meaning of your life? And that meaning can change with circumstances. Viktor Frankl had one meaning when he was, you know, at the head of the psychiatric department in a major hospital in Auschwitz. His meaning changed radically because his life situation changed. So that's what I basically um, uh, want to explore today. And as I mentioned last time, it's worth kind of broadening this discussion a little bit uh, around some of these uh, principles that have governed the history of psychology over the last uh, 100 years or so. Um, for Freud, just so we rem remind ourselves, for Freud, it was ultimately about the pleasure principle. And you look at a baby and you see the pleasure principle operating and you see it in most people's lives. They just want to be comfortable. The baby wants to eat when it wants to eat. It wants to uh, uh, cry when it wants to cry. It wants to be taken care of. It's governed by the pleasure principle. It's governed by the ego. Uh, it knows what it wants and it wants what it wants as soon as it wants it. And you have this process of socialization where the parents begin to teach the little child that, you know, you can't just eat whenever you want to. You have to go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom. You don't just defecate anywhere. So you have to go into toilet training. Uh, you have a bedroom. You can't just sleep anywhere you want. You can't sleep with us. So you have to sleep in the bedroom. So that the little child, governed by the pleasure principle, is forced by life to constrain. And according to Freud, that's the genesis of our neurotic complexes. Because when you don't socialize, you don't internalize what Freud called the superego, which is your conscience, which is instilled on you by your parents, into you by your parents, and then reinforced by the church and the government. There is a kind of a collusion, he said. Everybody's focusing on getting that little Johnny or little Susie to behave themselves, to believe what they're supposed to believe, and to comport themselves as good citizens. That takes a lot of socialization. So by the time you're at school and you're wearing your tie and you look like everybody else in your school uniforms, you've so repressed your own pleasure principle. And the pleasure principle, in Freud says, has kind of basically two aspects. One is, is sexual, and the other one is around power and aggression. So when you feel frustrated, you learn not to hit. You feel erotic, you feel ashamed. So in a Freudian world, that pleasure principle that all of us have is, is always being knocked about. And that's one reason why we're so violent. And we channel then our aggression into war. That war, in a Freudian sense, uh, understanding, is a necessary channeling of all the aggression that we pent up in ourselves because we repress all of our uh, pleasure-seeking instincts. Adler had a different theory. 
uh, Adler and uh, uh, Victor Frankel was part of the Adlerian uh, group until they threw him out because <laughs> he didn't agree with Adler saying that the basic uh, drive is not for pleasure. The basic drive is for power. You see a little baby. That baby cries. It's demanding that its mother give it milk. You look at Darwinian uh, social theory, evolutionary theory. It's the survival of the fittest. You know, when there's a, a, a brood of, of uh, kittens or dogs or little pigs or whatever, the runt, the weakest, are always cold out. They don't make it. It's the strong that survive. It's the strong male that becomes the alpha. It's the strong female that becomes the alpha female. Everywhere you look, people are competing. People are subordinating. People are dominating. And people are struggling for superiority and, and power. So as Adler looked at the world, he saw power dynamics, even as Freud saw pleasure dynamics and repressive dynamics. And in the drive for power, we derive our ethics. And uh, that's one reason why someone like Nietzsche would say that Christianity, uh, Judaism, uh, Islam, but principally Christianity, uh, is a slave mentality. Uh, it's an inculcation, inculcation of virtues that keep you enslaved to the superego. Thou shalt not. And so for Adler, how you deal with your power dynamics in relationship to social norms is the critical ingredient in how uh, happy you become uh, because those who ascend to the top uh, are uh, the ubermensch, are, uh, are the dominants. And it was when he disagreed with that, that uh, the young uh, Victor Frankl was uh, invited to leave the Adlerian society because he said, no, the basic dynamic that governs life is the will to, not to power, not to pleasure, but to meaning. So what is meaning? How, how do we understand uh, the individual's relationship uh, to uh, meaning? And he coined two terms with this. Uh, Neuro uh, neurosis and neurodynamics. And uh, even as Freud says, you, you develop neurotic complexes because you have your Oedipal complex and you don't go through it the right way and your sexuality gets repressed and so forth and so on. For Frankel, what creates the neurosis is your relationship with the external world. And if you're not capable of adequately and creatively finding meaning in what you're doing, either through your work or your relationships or what you're compelled to suffer through no choice of your own. That's what causes neurosis. It's very interesting. Two years of COVID, everywhere in the world, without exception, crime rates are going up, depression, mental illness, drugs, suicides, domestic abuse, domestic violence, uh, every indicator of social disease has gone up with COVID. Why? 
in a local therapy sense, because people weren't able to creatively find meaning in what they were being forced to suffer. You're locked down. You're isolated. You got to engage in social distancing. You got to wear a mask. You got to be vaccinated. Not once, but you got to get your boosters or you can't travel. All that constraint creates stress. And in Frankel's way of looking at things, it's your capacity in lockdown, in social distancing, to find meaning, creativity, that is the key to well-being and ultimately health. And what he was able to do, as you remember from some of the stories that I told last time, even in Auschwitz, is to so comport himself in relationship to what was going on, that in the depravity of dark suffering, he found meaning. You may remember that I, I read uh, the parts of the book uh, that had to do um, with his wife. And he had just been married. So you can just imagine the bloom of love was still fresh in his heart. She was in the camp with him, but in a completely different, he had no idea whether she was alive or dead. But it was his capacity to visualize her and adore her presence that gave him meaning and purpose. And when others around him were falling into suicide or depression or illness, he continued to maintain through that ethereal relationship, a communion with the great mother, a communion with the sacred feminine. Even after his wife was dead and he didn't know it until later, that was part of the way he gave himself meaning uh, in that um, uh, situation. And that leads to neuro uh, dynamics that uh, for uh, Frankel, uh, it is how one dynamically interacts with one's external environment, life, that determines the meaning that you seek. And this is a, a, a very uh, uh, fundamental. And I'm going to read some uh, parts of it um, because it's so exquisitely stated. He's a very, uh, very good writer. Uh, but this goes to the heart. And it's a very challenging. To, when I read it the first time, it took me a while to kind of internalize it. Uh, but he says um, um, that he considers it a dangerous misconception, he says, of mental hygiene, how we keep ourselves mentally healthy, to assume that what a person needs in the first place is equilibrium, or as it's called in biology, homostasis, that is, a tensionless state. What we actually need is not a tensionless state, but rather a striving and a struggling for a worthwhile goal, a freely chosen task. That, he says, is nuo dynamics. Nuo means the mind, the nuosphere, the mind. It's from the Greek. Now, I really want to pause here and unpack it. And I, I dare say my distinguished colleague from Hungary may have uh, uh, things to say about this as a Buddhist practitioner. 
But uh, Viktor Frankl would have fundamentally disagreed with the Buddha and most of Eastern mysticism. So just think about what most of us think we're supposed to be doing here, right? Detach. Don't let anything upset you. Breathe, meditate, go into yourself until you, you achieve peace of mind. Because if you're upset, if you're in the grip of what they call the monkey mind, you suffer. And that is at the heart of Buddha's teaching, that everything is suffering. There's a way to release yourself from suffering through detachment of your uh, self and following the Eightfold Path, because it's possible to reach that state of complete being called nirvana. And the Hindu theology is very similar to that. You know, you have the Atman and the Brahman, and you have the, the veils of illusion, Maya, and um, th that's what causes us to be attached to circumstances and so forth. The key is just to go away into the forest, get calm. Because if you get calm enough, you won't be reincarnated into another life form. So the whole purpose of practice is withdrawal from the world. Quite extraordinary. And logotherapy and Viktor Frankl's uh, school and great contribution, and he says that is a complete misconception. That life is about your interactivity with the larger environment, not your detachment from it. Life is about the tension, the dynamism, the suffering, as it were, in the pursuit of meaning. Because nothing is birthed into the world without pain. And if you really kind of think that through for a moment, that is a, a pretty profound challenge to what most of us think spirituality uh, is about. And that's one reason why I was so struck uh, about it. Uh, but he's, he, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a fundamental truth in what he's saying. You know, and... There's truth to what Freud is saying. We are governed by the pleasure principle for the most part, most of us, most of the time. We're governed by the power principle, most of us, most of the time. And we're governed by this relentless search for meaning. What is it all about? How do I find meaning in my life? And in this sense, Frankel is very uh, similar to Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle also said, it's not about an internal equilibrium. It's about a dynamic interactivity with your community to effectuate the virtues. And happiness as the supreme state is the pursuit of excellence. And that, therefore, you have to see the pursuit of happiness like preparing for the Olympics. You got to want it. You got to strive for it. You've got to eschew the vices and keep working on the, the virtues time and time and time again. So it's practice in the, in the Aristotelian Aristotelian way of understanding that the pathway to happiness, it's practice, 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 practice. So the virtuous finally becomes the natural. 
And the example that he gives um, uh, is a musician. And we all know that. You know, they say that the difference between a, a, a beginner and a moderate and a maestro is almost exclusively how much they practice. The more you practice, the better you get. If you don't practice, you don't get good at what you do. And so similarly for Frank, uh, Victor Frankl, our neuroses are derived from our inability to find meaning in our life circumstances. And our dynamism, the neurodynamism, is uh, uh, what comes into play as we interact with life uh, with a determination, situation by situation. Where is the meaning here? So there's no abstraction called the meaning of life. And you sit on the top of a mountain like uh, Rodin's thinker and contemplate the meaning of life in the universe. It is in your situation right now. And that situation will change and therefore your meaning can change. And that's the acuity that is needs to be developed through the logo therapeutic process to teach one how does one find meaning in a dynamic relationship with the world. So it's not about equilibrium. It's not about detachment. It's not about stasis. It's about dynamism. It's about attachment. It's about creative interaction. So that's, uh, that's what uh, Viktor Frankl would say would uh, be the distinction, I would say, uh, between logotherapy and other ways of viewing uh, the world. Uh, and he uh, uh, speaks a lot that the, the importance of this is because he called, he, he um, uh, uh, noted, particularly after the war, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, he lived till 1997. So he, he lived for a very long time after the war, lived to be over 90 years old, Victor Franco. Um, what he called the existential vacuum that plagues modernity. That in the absence of an understanding that every life has meaning in a very individual way. Boredom, as Schopenhauer said, boredom is the malaise. And the boredom makes one susceptible to two of the plagues of modernity that we see all around us. Consumerism and authoritarianism. Think about it for a moment. Most people out there are bored to tears. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. I think 60, 70% of the people polled don't like their jobs. They're in relationships that aren't particularly satisfying, they're not in control of their interior state or their exterior reality. So they become susceptible to the ads that say, you wanna be happy? Buy an iPhone. And they see the commercials for iPhones of young people dancing through the streets and interacting with people and, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? You take almost any commercial that we see deluging us through social media, TV, radio, and newspapers in every conceivable way that they get their messaging to us. 
I think the average person sees some, what is it like 10,000 commercials a day or, or something like that. They're all starting with your boredom. They're all starting with your discontent. They're all starting with your dis-ease by this. And you too shall be happy. And so most people are just consumers. Their paychecks are just on consumption. And the next iPhone comes out, the next smartphone, the next car model comes out, and we want to just buy, buy, buy. According to logotherapy, our consumerism is due to the fact that we don't have a creative relationship with our life. Because if you have a creative relationship with your life, you don't need the next iPhone. But then there's the other side of that. And that's totalitarianism, authoritarianism. And you see it rising up all over the world, rising authoritarianism. You've seen it here in the United States with COVID. We were all put in lockdown. We were all told to isolate. We were all told to stay 1.5 meters away from anybody. Nobody asked us, nobody voted, and we all went like sheep to the slaughter, every one of us. In our modernity, disconnected as we are from who we are, we become like a herd, says Frankel. And the autocrat, the bureaucrat, in this case, it was the bureaucrats, mandatory uh, regulatory mandates that just told us we got to do X as opposed to Y. And almost everybody did it. And then anybody who dissents is uh, taken off of uh, the media so that you have sort of a herd mentality. It's happening now with Ukraine. Look at the, the, the mainstream news. There is no dissent. Everybody's been to being told what to think. It is straight out of 1984. I would urge all of you who haven't done so recently to go read George Orwell's 1984 if you want to understand what's going on right now with the Ukraine. It's a massive propaganda toward war. and the exclusion of any contravailing opinion about what's going on. So totalitarianism, consumerism, are the byproducts, according to Frankel, of our inability to become authentic, meaningful, living human beings in a creative interaction with your environment. Because if you can attain that, according to Frankl, you become who you are and you're not any longer susceptible to the advertising and you're not susceptible to mass control because the very act of creating meaning creates individuality and the integrity of the I in relationship to the larger uh, world. So uh, that's another a very important aspect of uh, uh, local uh, therapy. And that brings us to, a, I think, the core of uh, Frankel. And I wanna uh, just dwell on this for a moment because it's so, it's so beautifully uh, written you know, he, then sort of the question is, so what is the meaning of life, right? 
The first thing he says is that the meaning of life differs from person to person, from day to day and from hour to hour. That's what I've been emphasizing. Meaning is situational. It's not some internal state that you get through meditating. You can meditate, but that does not create meaning. Very important that meditation and the feeling you get from meditation is not the meaning of your life. What matters, therefore, uh, is not the meaning of your life in general, sitting on top of a rock and thinking, what is the meaning of life? But rather the specific meaning of an individual's person's life in a given moment. The question of the meaning of life may actually be not what's the meaning of life, but ultimately a person should ask, how do they recognize who th they are? What is the meaning of life in your life? It's not an abstraction. It's a specific situational ingredient. So in answering the question of the meaning of one's life, one has to become responsible as an individual for that meaning. Thus, logotherapy, he says, sees in being responsible, responsibleness, the very essence of human existence. This is one of the most brilliant concepts I think any of us in a time of mass control, mass consumerism, mass just about everything where even we are now commodities. And Facebook now knows more about us than most of our intimate acquaintances and spouses and lovers and, and friends. The capacity for each individual to become responsible for their life becomes the cornerstone of any search for meaning. This is a huge concept, everyone. This is a huge concept that it is responsibleness, not some internal equilibrium or detachment or point of view that characterizes the essence of what it means to be truly human. And what that implies, he says, uh, it confronts each and every one of us with life's finiteness, as well as the finality that each one of our actions makes on our lives. So that logotherapy tries to make each patient fully aware of their responsibilities in a finite world where choices matter and you have to make them in a responsible way. So again, Frankl's in Auschwitz. Most people around him are dropping like flies. They can't cope. They have every excuse in the world to give up. He did not. He did not. Why? because he realized that he needed to be responsible for how he reacted in that instant. And because he did, because he took responsibility for who he was in that moment, his health was maintained and he made it through alive and lived for the next 50, 60 years. That's a, this, is, this is deep, deep material coming out of a deep life. Um, and as you know, which I emphasized last time, uh, is that in uh, Frankel's view, there were three ways that one creates meaning. One is in one's work. What are you actually doing? 
You know, whatever it is you're doing, do it with excellence. Do it with all your heart or don't do it, Frankel would say. And if you're not in a job that has meaning, go find one. Why? Because your life is finite. And you can squander and squander and squander your time. And do you know what most people say in the old folks home? They're full of regrets. I should have done that. I should have not done that. I should have made that decision. I should have made that. And they're sitting there on death's door full of regrets because of what they didn't do. And in the Frankel's view, it's because they didn't reach a moment where they seized what they were doing with their time as so valuable in a finite world that they made the choices to live congruently in what the Buddha would call right livelihood. So in Frankel's way of looking at the world and logotherapy, what we do with our time is really important, really important. That's our work. It's how we spend our life energy for most of us, you know, like eight hours a day. You need to love what you do. And if you don't, go find what you love. And then, says Frankel, you'll start to generate the kind of meaning that will give you uh, your elan. Secondly, is your relationships. Who you love who you interact with, who you bring in close. All of us know people who squandered their relationships on relationships that just weren't right and created havoc in your life. So Frankel would say, look at your relationships. How, what's the state of your relationships? Where are the relationships that find that give you the most meaning? Where are the relationships where you feel the most responsible? Those are, those are very important for you to uh, contemplate. And again, it's not going into some interior state. It's, it's how you're arranging who you are, not only by what you're doing, but by who you're relating to. That's what makes a very important difference uh, in whether you can create meaning. You've seen people in love. You've seen friends that have been together for like 60 years and they still love each other. I have that with our uh, two of our Dutch investors. There's these two guys, Bert and Martin. And they've been good friends since almost the day they met, you know, some like 40 years ago. And when you meet them for dinner, they're at ease with one another. They banter with one another. They're completely comfortable. You can feel that their relationship is feeding meaning into their lives because they chose well. Just think of the people you have where the relationships don't work out the grief, the shame, the guilt. So work and relationships. And then thirdly, for Frankel, as you might expect, is how we deal with suffering. And this is important even from a Buddhist point of view, because the Buddha said, and uh, you know, the Eastern mystics would agree, uh, that all is maya. We're misperceiving all the time. Therefore, life is suffering. Well, how do you interact with your suffering? How, how do you find your way through? Uh, not suffering you bring upon yourself, but suffering that is brought upon you through no will of your own. He says there's a fundamental difference. You have a bad relationship. You go through a separation. You have suffering. That's you. That's on you, he said. There's a way through, but it's on you. You're a Jew and you find yourself in a boxcar at the point of a gun and you end up at the uh, uh, Bergen-Belsen concentration camp and then into Auschwitz. That's not on you. That's situational. 
So when you go into a situational uh, uh, condition set of intense suffering, you still have to make a choice about where is meaning in this situation. So he says, there is no place, there's no condition a human being can be subjected to in work, in relationships, in suffering, where you don't ultimately have the choice to be responsible for the meaning that you are going to derive out of whatever it is that you're experiencing in this moment. I wanna conclude with um, a very interesting point that he makes right at the end, which I found so arresting. Because he rails time and again against this notion of determinism, nihilism, boredom, nothingness. He says that's just, that's, that's the absurd. We are ultimately all responsible for who we are and what we do and how we love and how we suffer. And then he ends with a paradox. And uh, it's the great yes, but. I love it. The yes, but. This is all true, but. He tells the story um, of a Dr. J, uh, who was the um, mass murderer of Steinhoff. Uh, the large mental hospital in Vienna where the Nazis started their euthanasia program. He held all the strings in his hands and was so fanatical in his job that he tried not to let a single per, pa, a patient go that he couldn't condemn to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. They were looking for anybody who was psychotic, neurotic, sociopathic, deviant in any way, sending them to the gas chambers because Hitler was after the master race and this guy really did his job, boy. After the war, he was captured by the Russians and um, apparently in Lubyanka prison, which is in Moscow. One day they came in shortly after he was there and his door was open and he had disappeared. And he was someone that you know, the, the, the Nazi hunters and the various people, um, you know, after the war looking for the, 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 the Nazis, like they found the Himmler in Argentina and so forth. They were looking for this guy, the mass murderer of Steinhoff. And they tracked him to the Lubyanka prison in Moscow. And um, then Franco writes, That one day, a former Austrian diplomat who had been imprisoned behind the Iron Curtain for many years, first in Siberia and then in Lubyanka, came to Frankel's office for a consultation. And he, knowing who I was, asked me whether I happened to know this Dr. J, uh, this mass murderer in St of Steinhoff. And uh, Frankel actually knew him, knew of him. Um, and then this diplomat says to him, what's well, so interesting, I made his acquaintance in Lubyanka. There he died about the age of 40 from cancer of the urinary bladder. Before he died, however, he showed himself to be the best comrade you can imagine. He gave consolation to everybody. He lived up to the highest conceivable moral standard. He was the best friend I ever met during my long years in prison. 
the mass murderer didn't let anybody go that he could conceivably send to Auschwitz, ends up in Lubyanka prison and becomes the best friend that this Austrian diplomat ever had while he was in his prison, imprisonment. The wisdom that Frankel gleans from this deep antinomial contradiction and paradox as he said, out of this, how can any of us dare to predict the behavior of any person? We may predict the movements of a machine, of an automation. More than this, we can even try to predict the mechanisms and dynamisms of the human psyche itself. Many have tried. But the human being is more than the psyche. And then he goes on. But freedom is not the last word. Freedom is only part of the story and half of the truth. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. This is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast of the United States be supplemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. So that the point that he's making is that even if you're Dr. J and you've created great crimes, you can change your situation and you can become another person because you create meaning in a different way. Now, the profundity of this is beyond my capacity to articulate it in language. But the truth that Frankel is getting at is that it's not about internal, but the relationship of the internal with the external. And it's not even about freedom. It's the relationship between freedom to act and the choices that are out there and the one choice that makes one responsible. And this Dr. J made that transition. That's, that's a powerful, powerful koan for all of us to contemplate before we condemn anybody that circumstances shape and reveal simultaneously. And you change the circumstance and what is revealed and what is shaped completely changes. That's how complex we human beings are. And finally, just his last paragraph with which he closes the book. A human being is not one thing among others. Things determine each other. But the human being is ultimately self-determining. What we become within the limits of endowment and environment, who we are, where we are, we have made out of ourselves. In the concentration camps, for example, in this living laboratory and on this testing ground, we watched and witnessed some of our comrades behave like swine while others behave like saints. Each human being has both potentialities within himself. Which one is actualized depends on decisions 
but not conditions. That's so powerful. When our generation is realistic, for we have come to know humanity as we really are. After all, it is the human being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. It is the human being also who entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Israel on their lips. So that, my friends, is, is my little uh, reflection on uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, who I uh, have contemplated for many years. I, I read his book, uh, I think, when it first came out, uh, and several times subsequently, although this is the first time I've taught it. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, you uh, know the drill, uh, all the students, we expect to see your hands up uh, and anyone else who's an auditor as well. But we start with uh, my distinguished uh, Hungarian colleague, Dr. Zabo. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much for this beautiful expose of Viktor Frankl's uh, book. Well, you delivered it powerfully. It's such a powerful message. And uh, and you gave us so much food for thought. Uh, well, it's I'm not even sure where to start, but clearly I, I, I need to jump right in. And uh, and one of your remarks about, um, you know, how Buddhism or not really coalesce with uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, uh, meaning. Well, that both said that uh, suffering is an uh, inevitable part of our life and uh, we have the freedom uh, how we uh, control our attitude towards the situation uh, we are in. So I, I do see a lot of uh, Buddhist uh, thought in Viktor Frankl's uh, philosophy. Uh, I found uh, your uh, um, very meaningful expression about uh, find uh, um, love in what you do. Uh, so even if even if uh, I think uh, my my lovely father he used to always say that uh, when I was asking him that Dad why are you doing this this is just it's really not you and I said no this is what I'm supposed to do now and. Uh, I, I need to do it well. And I learned so much from him. And even him who said that he was an ardent atheist, uh, I think he really lived uh, the most spiritual way throughout his life. So it's one thing what people say and the one thing what they do, but uh, really um, acts speak louder than, than words. It was also super interesting what he said and what you well reiterated that throughout our lives, uh, the meaning changes. Uh, and, and I'd like to have a little special interview with Dr. Jim Garrison. How did you find, how did you do the seeking in your life? And uh, did you find uh, finding the meaning throughout your life at different stages as, uh, as uh, surprising? Or how did you come to uh, this very conscious uh, finding the meaning of your life? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 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 very briefly, um, I think I, one of the reasons why I, I resonate with uh, Frankel is that um, I think my search for meaning, as he indicates, has been very circumstantial. As circumstances, I was in a missionary school when I was a little boy, and that context had a certain logic and internal um, uh, reality. Then all of a sudden, age 15, I was back in the United States um, in a, a high school of, you know, 1,000, 2,000 students, all Americans uh, in California, and that was the reality. Uh, and so I think because my circumstances changed so much, I began to realize at an early age that what Frankel said is true, that everything is finite and therefore everything is contingent. Um, and um, uh, uh, so each, each turn of the wheel when I would find myself in different circumstances, uh, one of the great ones uh, was when I found myself at Cambridge University writing my PhD. 
And that became my complete focus for seven years, mm. writing my PhD. And then it was done. And then all of a sudden you realize that your, 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 your situation is going to change. And therefore, and that's when I threw myself into Soviet American relations. I went in a completely new field. And then when that cut off, and then uh, I went into uh, ubiquity and mm -hmm. started to think, what would it be like to create a global university? And for the last 16 years, my meaning has been derived through what I have done to create ubiquity university in the wisdom school and the Chartres Academy and working with you and all the wonderful people on the team and our students. That's for me where my meaning is derived right now. Mm -hmm. And because of that, and I think it would be for you too, Georgie, because you've been so masterful as our Dean of, of Graduate uh, Studies, that once you're, you're on, the, on the meaning uh, uh, trap line, the more meaning you create, the more meaning you generate and the more fulfilled your life becomes. Mm -hmm. And then your work and your relationships all meld into one. Uh, and uh, it becomes generative of the kind of energy you need to keep going through the suffering that inevitably is the lot of humankind. Does that make any sense? No, absolutely. I so agree with you that, 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 that when, you, when you do have that, coher that coherence, then you do derive so much energy from, from that meaningful uh, co uh, connection. And also, it, it was so important that you mentioned the responsibility, which we talked about the last time as well. And also that I think a very strong word here is, uh, is gratitude, that that's what I do find that at the end of the day, I always review my day and, and, and find gratitude to, to what really transpires as to me as, as, as positive and even, even something that is not, I know that later and in the, in the future that will turn to be positive. So it is yeah. really about the mindset and that's what Viktor Frankl uh, talked so much, uh, so much about and really just going back and this will be my last comment uh, about, uh, you know, the Buddhist notion that how much of the Buddhist monks are imprisoned by the Chinese and they're so strong because they know that maybe they can hurt their bodies but their minds and yeah. hearts and so they cannot touch because nobody can really. Yeah. Well, you look at the Ukrainians. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're taking the, 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 the Russians on. I mean, the, uh, uh, there's a huge meaning being generated in Ukraine right now in the midst of that destruction because they're filling the crisis, as it were, with a creative intention to yeah. uh, toward national sovereignty. And mm. of course, we'll see it how it all plays out. Um, but you're right about those monks. Um, they, they're stronger than the prison cell. Absolutely, yeah. And that's what actually pisses the Chinese off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's okay. turn to our audience. Thank you so all much. All you students here, uh, where's they, where did they raise hands? I somehow, when I was made host, I can't see. You, you need to go to participants uh, and uh, no one no one raised their hand. So maybe we can okay. go to the chat. Well, let's chat. see a chat. Oh, uh, your PhD dissertation uh, published or available online. Uh, well, I know my PhD was done way before the internet was even a dream in DARPA's eye. Um, uh, and um, it was on the darkness of God um theology after hiroshima and it was actually published as a book by scm press uh called the darkness of god theology after hiroshima uh it's been out of date for many many years uh but it never did get online because uh, it was 20 years before the internet uh, uh but it's a it's a great read if anybody wants some pretty dense theology about uh uh, uh, these matters. Uh, and I see that Leo also asked a question about, uh, in his edition of the uh, 1984 postscript uh, in Frankel, the case for a tragic optimism, any comment on this section? Uh, and it's closing lines, the world is in a very bad state, but everything will become still worse unless each of us does his best. 
that's tragic optimism. And I think if there's ever a moment, thank you for that, Leo. Uh, if there's ever a moment for tragic optimism, it's now. Uh, when you look at climate change, you look at the rise of authoritarianism, you look at consumerism, you look at the mass thought to control uh, being orchestrated by the state and tech companies and big con corporate interests, it's hard to see how there's a way out. But just like in Auschwitz, um, just like uh, the, the, the monks in the prisons in the Chinese camps, that's tragic optimism. There's a tragedy unfolding. But in the face of that tragedy, we still have to be responsible. Frankel is right. There's never a reason under any circumstance to give up, no matter what you're suffering, even if you're in a death camp on your way to the gas chambers, you're still called upon to embrace tragic optimism. And that's how he ends the book. It's the human psyche that both created the, ga the gas chambers and was reciting the Lord's Prayer and the Shema Israel walking in. That's the agony and the ecstasy of what it means to be human. And all of us can access both. Remember Dante, he never heard of a crime that he knew in his heart he couldn't commit. And yet we're responsible for the integrity of our response to whatever's happening. And there are no exceptions. Frankel would say, and I would agree, there are no exceptions. How do you imagine the statue of responsibility? What quote would you put on the base? <laughs> Something from Frankel. Uh, and uh, 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 and I would I would say something about his notion of of responsibleness as being the other side of freedom, as important as freedom. And in fact, without responsibleness, freedom is dissipated away. And I think that's one reason why we have such a rise of authoritarianism around the world, is because the citizens have not been responsible in the way that they should be. Uh, but Ida, um, uh, there you go. Jonathan Harvey saying, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. That would be a good one for the base of the statue. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, Georgie. Jim, would you mind to comment on Michelle Moss's uh, um, message? She says that meaningful engagement, listening to the heart and the imagination, imagine if dot, 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 in this given moment, what is the meaning of this and how do I feel? I feel, therefore I am. Descartes was not saying, I am responsible for my life and its meaning. Yeah, um, I was commenting on this just the other day to someone that I so fundamentally disagree uh, with Descartes. I don't think it's true at all. You know, I doubt, therefore I am. I think it's about I, I, uh, I believe, uh, I'm meaningful, I'm authentic, therefore I am. I'm responsible, therefore I am. I'm very much with Frankel on this one. Um, I, you know, and I, I agree with him also. It's not ultimately about the pleasure principle. It's not ultimately about power. It's about how we create meaning through our capacity to be responsible for our lives. So that's what the way I would, I would put it. I, I saw Dave, Dave McQuarrie's hand just a minute ago, and now I can't see it anymore. I don't know, Dave, has he changed your mind or? <laughs> okay, he's there again. Oh, there we go. Dave McQuarrie, uh, allow to talk. Hey, Dave, what do you have to say about these matters? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm vacillating and going in various di different directions, partly because I, I so much enjoy 
uh, both you and Georgie in, in this particular presentation. Uh, but, but two things have stood out for me. One, as you, as you may or may not recall, my primary training was as a Gestalt therapist. And in yeah. Gestalt, the fundamental principle is awareness, but the three tenets of Gestalt are awareness, contact with the environment, and personal responsibility. Mm. So I was, I'm just thinking to myself whether or not there would have been any actual contact between Fritz Perls and, uh, and Frankel um, because of the overlap of, of the uh, careers in various, in various ways. So that was, that's one reflection. The other is that I recall being at a Vipassana re retreat, probably in my mid-50s, 10-day uh, silent retreat, in which for probably an hour, I had a mystical experience of absolutely profound equanimity. And I decided within that, I didn't like it. I wanted contact. I wanted to be in this world in a way that uh, had a liveness, which was missing from the equanimity. Mm. So both of those are sort of, you know, what I'm rambling around with at the present time. Well, that's so uh, interesting, uh, Dave, because I just finished re reading David Grieber's and David Weingrove's book, A Theory of Everything, which I would recommend to everybody. It is a hugely important book on human origins. And they make precisely that point. They say, if you really look at the human being, it takes like a Buddha to go away, reach a state of internal equilibrium that he can hold for more than, you know, 15 minutes. But he said, a human beings in dialogue can hold their concentration for hours and days effortlessly that there's something in the human being. This is Frankel's point. Thank you for bringing this in. There's something in the human being that's dialogic, interactive. And it is in the interactivity that we find our meaning. That's why Aristotle said it's the polis. It's us in community. That's the reality. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. And therefore, Frankel says, anyone who separates themselves from the dynamism of Earth, go into the forest and gaze at their natal, navel for 40 years, uh, is, may be successful in reaching equanimity, but they will never become authentic as a human being until they start interacting with the polis. Um, so I, I think that's just worth, I don't want to push that too far because we're all meditators, but I think it's worth contemplating um, uh, what Dave is bringing in here, because it's certainly um, in uh, uh, a theory of everything uh, that is having such an impact out there uh, in the uh, intellectual community. Um, uh, and whether uh, Fritz Perls and Frankel met, you know, I, I would be surprised if they didn't, because Fritz Perls was, you know, doing his thing you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and Gestalt was a big, you know, school. And Frankel came to the United States many times. Um, I don't know whether he went to Essen. I'll have to call Michael Murphy and see if uh, he went to Esalen. Uh, I'm sure he met Fritz Perls because they were so alike in so many uh, ways. Yeah, it, it, there's, there's interesting sidebars uh, there. And, uh... And I, the, the, I was going to say something, but I've lost it. So anyway, th thank you for your contribution again. Thank you, Dave. Uh, anyone else before we bring this to a close? Um, I was interested to see uh, that I, you can still get my book uh, online. That's extraordinary. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd given it up for lost. <laughs> Because it was published back in 1982, I think it was. Uh, 
at, at the end of my doctoral work. And also the BBC did a one hour documentary on it. It caused quite a stir at the time. Oh, cool. And, uh, I would love it, to watch that. Maybe it's on YouTube. It could be. I don't know what's out there. It'd be, it'd be fun to look to see if uh, the, again, it's called the darkness of God. Um, ah, we're trying to find it. That would be a good research project. For but for me. those of you who are students, to Frankel's point, and with this I'll close, my PhD dissertation was one of the most meaningful experiences in my entire life. At the age of 20, Five when I started till the age of 32 when I finished, I threw myself in with complete abandon into the question, why is it that after several billion years of evolutionary life, our species has brought the entire process to the brink of extinction through thermonuclear war? It was like looking at the sun without dark glasses. And Cambridge University, my supervisor told me that was too big a question. And I struggled for two years and almost quit a number of times because they said, you can't write a dissertation on that big a question. And I said, but it's the only question in the world. And it was my tenaciousness that finally convinced my supervisor that actually I was right. And he became my strongest supporter. And, uh, but it was going through that process and realizing that, that my life literally depended on my capacity to answer that question. And it shaped the rest of my life. Who I am now is because of that dissertation. So when you create meaning Meaning is not an abstraction. Meaning is an existential burning in your soul. Because you're filling your work with purpose. You're filling your relationships with love. You're filling your suffering with the capacity to just simply endure in tragic optimism. That's where meaning comes from. It is the combustion of your relationship with yourself as it's manifested in your external world, because it's all interconnected. So when you interact with your work, you're interacting with yourself. When you're interacting with someone you love, you're interacting ultimately with yourself and nature and suffering. And so as we think about Viktor Frankl and we think about humanity search for meaning. Let us all, as a result of this contemplation, everyone, I would beseech you uh, to think more deeply about how you use your freedom as an anvil upon which you hammer out the responsibility that you have in this moment for what you're doing and who you're loving and how you're overcoming obstacles. So that's the book. And thank you so much. And next month, by the way, we have a real treat. We have Thomas Hubel, uh, who most of you know uh, from his extraordinary work on transgenerational uh, trauma. Georgie and I had the great pleasure of, of awarding him. We had a great oral exam uh, on his PhD. He's taken a PhD from Ubiquity University. Uh, is one of our most distinguished uh, PhD uh, alumni now. Uh, we had a very vigorous discussion uh, for an hour and a half, Georgie and Peter Mary and I and, and, and Thomas. And um, uh, so Georgie had the idea of asking him to do, what is his favorite book? And his favorite book is the Tao Te Ching. So for the next two months in, uh, May and June, we're going to have Thomas Hubel on the Dowdy Ching. It's going to be marvelous. Uh, I have no doubt. So uh, uh, thank you, Georgie. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you uh, next time. 
Uh, it's always the second Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, Hello. on the second Tuesday of every month. Thank you, Jim. More yeah, the best. Get two containers. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Hmm.